Of course, I've got a love of food and a love of creativity, but I also have a love of being able to engage my teams to and give them the opportunity to, to be involved with that process. So the longer I've been in you know, this job, um, the less I've actually had to um, create dishes, which is, I suppose, you know, where I wanted the direction of my career to be. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The path to success is different for most of us, but one of the guides that help one's journey lies in working under the right people. More than most industries, mentors have become key to the development of young chefs and wait staff who are eager for a career in the most vibrant industry of all, hospitality. But what makes a great mentor and what impact does a great mentor have on young people finding their feet? Oliver Gould is the executive chef of Asado and Palermo's in Melbourne. Oliver, how are you going? Good, thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Uh, what's things like at the moment? You're in um, lockdown number six in in Melbourne. What, what sort of impact has it had on you? Um, yeah, I think this this one being so close to lockdown five, it's been a really big uh, kick in the guts. Um, obviously, again, um, you know, it takes probably a good two weeks to recover um, from each lockdown to get, I suppose, let's say seventy percent back to where we should be and then the next two weeks there's a bit more confidence around Melbourne where we can get back to close to 100. Um, So, yeah, it's um, three steps back, one step forward at the moment. So uh, it's it's rather deflating but we're doing what we can to, you know, keep the team engaged and, you know, try and and move forward with whatever initiatives we can to to keep the, uh, the restaurants... Um, going and you know visible and promoting them in the in the way that we need to. You're the executive chef over two restaurants with the big kitchen brigade. What's it like um, making sure the mental health of the younger chefs um, is okay during this time and getting the best out of them? Um, I suppose that's the the challenge of any manager or. or business owner um, with with any team but particularly in hospitality um, knowing you know from years of a, years of it in the in the industry that mental health is um, something that does impact a lot of people um, fortunately we're in an age now where you know a lot of people are certainly open to talking about it and certainly want to bring up any issues or concerns they have um, as well you know my, my job is to understand whether others others below me have have something that they need help with so you know we we, we certainly um each lockdown reassure staff that um obviously there's the support for them whether it's the financial support um particularly with casuals we do make sure that you know they they get some hours to be able to to pay rent um you know through the week it's certainly our obligation to make sure that they're you know, engaged in something, um, you know, we try and keep them occupied with, you know, certain tasks or activities that they can help with at home so that they feel like they're still um, part of the business. So, um, yeah, it's it's significant um, right across Australia, men- mental health at the moment. And, you know, we all know the, the stats of, um, you know, the youth suicide and, and, and whatnot. So we, you know, we certainly do our best to to engage with our staff to keep them um, on, a, on a positive um, path. You've had an incredible career and won many accolades that we can get to at some stage, but where did it all start for you? When did the interest in food begin? Um, initially, I suppose in my, you know, early days, I, you know, was active at active in cooking um, at home um, and, and home food was, you know, fairly fairly basic but tasty. But, I, you know, as a young kid, always enjoyed making cakes and slices and, you know, pastas and things with mum and licking the spoons and feeling like I was, you know, <laughs> learning along the way. And um, it got to, you know, the point of mid – Mid high school, where we needed to choose a, I suppose, a work placement path. So I chose um, hospitality and w- ended up working at a, a restaurant called The Keg, which um, back in the day was a bit of a chain around Australia. And um, I sort of got the, the, the bug there, albeit not 
for the right things in the beginning. It wasn't necessarily regarding food, but I loved being, you know, involved in a team environment. I love, I suppose, you know, being given an opportunity to, you know, speak my mind and, um, you know, talk to older people, um, you know, above me. I was a, started as a 15-year-old and worked at the keg for <clears throat> a couple of years, and most people there were all sort of late high school or uni students. So it sort of, it, it engaged me with, um, I suppose, learning how to talk with adults, um, you know, taught me, taught them, taught me some other things as well. It taught me how to drink and, and be silly and stupid at the, at the same time. But it, at least it got me, um, I suppose, addicted to the beginnings of hospitality. Um, and I knew that that was the career that I, I would seek following that. You ended up uh, taking an apprenticeship at the iconic Stoke House many moons ago. What was it like stepping into that kitchen and do you have any stories from that time? Um, I mean, Stoke House was a, a, a special place and, and certainly was well before I got there and, and continued to be when I left. Um, it, it was a place that, um, you know, what, no matter what part you had to play there, you felt like you were something important and part of something um, really significant. Um, and obviously, Stoke House had a reputation for many years as the, the place to be um, for, you know, all the celebs coming to town before the, the casino opened. And, um, you know, there was always, you know, lots of energetic, um, you know, young Brighton kids to work with that always, you know, lifted you up and you know, drove you forward. Um, you know, particularly in the kitchen. When I when I started uh, as an eighteen year old, I, you know, I probably didn't fit in um, initially. I suppose based on where I where I'd come from, I didn't have the the skill set that a lot of those guys had that had been, you know, c- cooking high volume food for a number of years. And you know, a lot of people that were probably not burnt out, but the end, end of that end of their career as well. That you know had significant um, tempers and um, could have a tantrum uh, on any on any given day but at, at the end of the day it was always something that um, you know we we all enjoyed um, being a part of it so you know I think on my first day um, I was downstairs and you know middle of summer back then there was probably eight eight chefs and a couple of kitchen hands um, working and it got to you know 11 30 um, before service and you know I was like gearing up to get into it I was probably you know getting ready to cook on the fryer at the at that point um and all of a sudden everyone disappeared from the kitchen and I was like oh what's 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 happening here is there some sort of prank that's about to be thrown on me and I I walked around and couldn't find anyone so I went out the back into the bin area and there was 10 people having a cigarette together um so you know that sort of taught me you know quickly i suppose the the not the type of people working with you but the the habits that i suppose hospitality um people had in in that time so if you needed a break it was to have a cigarette um which you know i I didn't um, i didn't pick up straight away but it certainly was something that something that was uh recognized further down the career that you know if you wanted to sit down you probably needed to have a smoke with you um but you know stokehouse you know certainly had a lot of wonderful um interesting personalities and and people that you know i i looked up to as a as a young young chef and certainly people that i you know was able to lean upon um one of my good friends these days he was a junior sous downstairs and um i i was sick of cooking fish and chips and um, bowls of chips for the first six months and f- fortunately I started driving him home because he'd lost his license and um, I sort of told him, uh, you know, I can cook steaks. I've been cooking for three years before this. He's like, oh, can you? Um, so we, I think it took a week or two and he popped me on the grill um, for a couple of shifts and everyone soon realised that it could actually do the job and do it fairly well um, in in a kitchen where there was probably five or six apprentices at the time and it was something you'd fight for to be seen and, you know, get get onto the next section to continue learning. And I sort of jumped the jumped the herd and um where it was able to, you know, show my show my skills and unfortunately move up and, and continue to learn. Mentors have played a real key feature in 
the building of your career, who's been real influences on you and what sort of impact have they had? Um, well, I'd say, um, you know, although I worked with Morris Esposito for a short period of time, but he certainly um, engaged me in um, the care and precision needed to cook and execute beautiful food. So I, I, I respect Morris for what he's done over the years. He's, he's always been a, a stalwart in um, Italian cooking in, in, in Melbourne. Um, and following him leaving um, upstairs, um, Anthony Massara joined us from, from Radii. And, um, you know, I suppose he was the first person I, I realised that um, – you know, he knew he's, he'd obviously knew, you know knew how to run a, a kitchen and knew how to um, assert himself with the right people and knew how to manage people in in the way that they needed to be managed. Um, and and you know, fortunately for me, and the guy that I was talking about before, give me a leg up downstairs. He was upstairs at the time, and both of them, um, I suppose, understood my capabilities and and. Um, engaged me in what I needed at the time to, I suppose, get myself from, again, being at the the bottom of the kitchen um, to the top, um, enabling me to prove myself along the way. But I suppose as a, as a mentor, Anthony certainly gave me that that um, opportunity to to step into the the head chef role after a couple of years with him, and um, he certainly. Um, continued to men- mentor me, I suppose, from afar as he stepped out of the kitchen. Um, but I suppose it was a it was a level of getting thrown in the deep end as well to run Stokehouse um, when we reopened after a, a renovation to really hope you know to really ingrain my um, my creativity on a menu. Well, tell us about what it was like in your first head chef role. How different is it to just being part of the team and? and well, what sort of footprint did you leave in regards to food? Um, I suppose from – let's talk about managing the kitchen. I, I was unfortunately one of those things where I just thought I had to do everything myself. Um, and I didn't – although I had some great mates working with me, initially I didn't engage them in, in um, contributing to the running of the kitchen until I sort of realised that, oh, shit, I've, I've lost a few staff here and if I lose these guys, I'm, I'm – I'm stuffed. So, um, you know, from a management's perspective, I really, I really um, recognised um, valuing staff that um, had great potential and had already proven themselves. And I, so I was able to sort of, you know, offload some responsibility and, and incorporate um, my team into to, to what we were building. Um, from a food perspective, um, you know, I really, although the style of the food at Stokehouse was always um, fantastic. I sort of wanted to take it to another level. And at the time I thought another level was putting three or four more elements on addition, trying to compete with the, the two hat, three hat um, restaurants in Melbourne, um, you know, which worked for a while. But again, you recognize that, you know, in, a, in particularly in a busy restaurant like Stokehouse, there's some, some things are, Possible and others aren't. So um, I suppose ultimately I recognised that the what what I could give to Stokehouse was um, you know a, a, a balanced menu um, that focused on produce and flavour and um, you know dishes that had one or two elements that perhaps um, not hadn't been seen before but hadn't been thought about going with a particular particular item. You know, as an example, putting. Murray cod with a, um, you know, a, a, a bacon consomme or something like that. Um, you know, it's probably been done before, but certainly hadn't been things like that hadn't been, um, you know, put forward at Stokehouse in the past. This influence that you had uh, resulted in two chefs' hats, and you also won the 2014 Young Chef of the Year with the Age Good Food Guide. What sort of impact did those accolades have on you? Um, the two hats, I, I suppose, was, um, you know, certainly recognition for uh, hard work and, um, you know, not, not just for myself, but it's a whole business and um, a group of people that, you know, had, be, had been or always had strived to, to offer the best service and food they could. Um, I suppose over the years I've recognised that, um, 
you know, if you're chasing hats, it actually puts a lot of um, does put a lot of pressure pressure on you. And um, you know, when you go from two to one to two to one to one and and whatnot, it can be um, you know, as a youngster, it was sort of quite um, you know, it's quite a, a a burden if you if you felt you hadn't succeeded that year. But um, you know, I do you know hats are important and a great accolade but i i do certainly now appreciate that you know if you if you know you're doing something great for yourself and that's uh that's all you need to do um uh, in regarding the you know the award you know again it's you know any any award or accolades about um you know recognizing the work that you've put in and, and thankfully the the young chef of the year award um i suppose is something that recognizes future um potential in someone as well as also what they've what they've already achieved so um you know that's something that's certainly held me in good stead it's nice to put on a a bio um and have people people recognize that you you know you've won something that's you know what in the industry was was or is perceived to be quite special so um you know and for me to you know to to hire and train young staff these days although they they may not um you know understand what the good food guide was back in the day. Um, you know, they see awards, awards and things like that as, as you know, um, something exciting and, you know, look at me as someone they'd like to work for. At the Stokehouse, it's when you started a real focus on quality produce and um, you've made many connections with producers across the country. What's some of the real important connections that you've had with producers? Um, I, I've... You know, I've, I've recognised there's people that you know, there's people that you you align yourself that, you know, if you can in, get engage them and build a relationship, those relationships, um, you know, uh, often benefit both of you and both, you know, by that meaning, you know, you 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 you, you have access to their best produce and um, you have access to, you know, being able to visit visit their farms and and train your staff and get them to understand and appreciate those those um, those um, pro, pro, the produce as well. So you know, one one that's probably stands out is O'Connor's O'Connor's beef. We were using you know them in at Stokehouse back in the day. You know, let's say ten years ago, and I was fortunate enough to to you know do a, a video with Tim O'Connor for Savor Australia one year. And um, I suppose now with the direction I've taken with um, you know basically a all meat focus venue O'Connor's um, certainly stands out as at, at the forefront of the the basis of our meat meat offering um, a lot of the producers that I've probably had an opportunity to engage with more were when I went over to, to WA um, West Australia is great at heralding their local produce and um, they really do strive on you know making sure that there's a connection between um, paddock to plate or cedar cedar plate as you, you might say so um, that really opened my eyes to you know understanding the importance of um, engaging the grower and the producer to benefit um, both areas this episode is proudly supported by montague handpicked for you the things that we're really looking for in plums first of all they've got to be sweet we're really looking for a full flavour explosion um, in our plums. Red flesh is critically important to us, higher in antioxidants, so all that good stuff. And then we're also looking to add a slightly firmer texture, so there's a little, almost a little crunch. You know, that's a real driver for us. For more information, go to montague.com.au. You left the Stokehouse and moved to Perth to take the helm of the kitchen at the Shaw House. Tell us about that experience and and what it was like compared to um, being a head chef in Melbourne. Um, it was a it was a bit of a uh, whirlwind experience. Um, you know, I'd, I'd sort of been looking at other options post Stokehouse, and and fortunately this option came up. But I was a bit hesitant to ship myself over there with my my partner. So um, by the time I said yes, let's do it. And they they wanted to open the doors a week later, so because due, due to obviously having you know having everything ready to go, they just needed a head chef and a kitchen team. So um, you know uh, when you've got a week to sort your shit out and hire a, a group of chefs in a in a um, interstate town, um, you know that was a 
Dorney experience and um, unfortunately with the the job market in Perth, um, although we you know, we talk about the job market in Melbourne being tough a lot of the time. It was extra tough in WA until all the backpackers got there. So um, if you applied for a job, you got one um, at uh, at Shaw House initially. And um, for- fortunately, I had, um, I had um, you know, four strong um, chefs to begin with. So we, we it was basically, a, you know, I'd say we were probably the most expensive team in Australia. I had to hire um, four sous chefs and a junior sous chef just to get uh, bums onto seats so that we could operate a kitchen at full capacity and, and Shaw House, I suppose, in a similar vein and demographic to Stoke House was waterside on just north of Cottesloe Beach, um, in a big outdoor deck with 250 seats. Um, you know, we'd be full breakfast, lunch and dinner for, you know, five, six months of the year. So, uh, you know, the initial part was the hard part and, and ongoing um, you know, w- with anything in hospitality, if you can, as soon as you start losing staff, you've got to then, you know, it's a, it's a cycle of recruitment and, um, you know, trying to fill, fill holes and, you know, plug, plug holes where you need to. But, um, you know, once that was all stable, I really, you know, I really enjoyed having a new lease on create creativity. Um, we weren't certainly looking at, you know, becoming a hatted restaurant over there. It was sort of a balance between, you know, um, good quality casual and, again, trying to find a, a new element that, um, you know, diners in Perth perhaps hadn't been exposed to before. So over in uh, WA, you had a real connection with producers. Is it, was there any produce that really stood out for you over there? Uh, I suppose looking at the produce in WA broadly, a lot of it, I, uh, you know, I'd, ha- I'd had had access to in Melbourne. Um, but if I look at the produce that I'd loved using in Melbourne, but perhaps was either too expensive or difficult to to access, I'd look at things like Shark Bay blue summer crabs and uh, Shark Bay prawns. Um, you know, Fremantle octopus was always a, a winner and highly regarded as one as a, one of the best oki suppliers in the country. Um, but I, I suppose as I developed my menus there, there were certainly dishes that stood out as um, customer favourites or, or dishes that, you know, uh, sold um, in exponential quantities. So, you know, looking at a blue summer crab and prawn linguine, which – I suppose you put that on any menu in Australia, it'll do well. But if you're sitting on a beach um, on a hot sunny day, that's that was certainly the the dish of choice. So, um, you know, I'd go up. I fortunately was able to go up and see Peter Jacks at um, Abacus Fisheries, and we built a, a good connection while I was there. Um, and particularly when I'd buy, you know, 300 kilo at a time of picked crab meat off him, he certainly. Um, recognised that I was someone that, um, you know, was passionate about his product and we certainly worked well together to to get the best out of, um, you know, his his products as, as well as promoting them in, 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 in Perth. Um, but even if you, you know, you delve down to, down south to, you know, some of the, some of the regions down there, um, you know, looking, looking down, um, yeah, you know, looking down to to Margaret River, there's you know, this beautiful um, Margaret River Wagyu that um, you know was was something that was always special. Obviously, those the, the Marins um, that WA are, you know, regard as one of their prized possessions. If you, although if you you know you might put Marin on your menu, and um, you know it's really hard to make a buck off Marin um, and and do it well with. with um, Perth people because they, you know, they've probably been exposed to it for for so long. But those those ingredients, um, you know, were certainly things that we could play with and again um, work on to make a, a, a more unique dish that um, would entice uh, our customers to come back. These days, you're executive chef of a group that's got a real focus on Argentinian cuisine what's it been like being at the helm of this and this exploration of of such a meat focused um offering um i've certainly had to spin my way of thinking around um just touching on previous jobs um lastly you know they were were both on the on the beach so obviously a high-end um 
a high focus on seafood. So spitting that over to Palermo and Asado being part of the um, being part of the San Telmo group, uh, you know, my way of thinking certainly changed. Our food offering, um, you know, certainly designed around the backbone of uh, offering high quality beef and cooked on a asado parisha. Um, so looking at, re- you know, really enhancing uh, flavors with wood fire and charcoal cooking. Um, so my th- I suppose from a creative perspective, um, you know, the meat can speak for itself, but it's all about tying it into the rest of the the theme of cuisine. Um, and we've linked Palermo um, to have a, a more Italian focus of Argentina and Asado's taken the, the line of a, a Spanish influence. So um, I suppose my work has sort of been able to define um, two, diff- two menus that are similar but still speak for themselves. Um, you know, so Italians, Italian influence is certainly directed Palermo towards, um, you know, having a having a crudo on and some, you know, focaccia and um, the occasional pasta, whereas asado would, um, you know, we've we've always got a, a strong focus on uh, tapas and pinchos and, um, you know, focus on um, you know seasonal seasonal vegetables that would, you know, would easily grill and and take on some of that that beautiful smoke from, from our style of cooking. And um, in particular, both restaurants have a, a fire pit. So um, initially that fire pit concept of cooking whole animals, whether it be pig and a, a lamb, you know, that took a, a, a good deal of time to, to get right. Um, and, you know, a good bit of research, but uh, you know, after three years, we've certainly, certainly got our, our, um, our menus and the restaurant where we want them to be. What sort of impact has it had on you as a, as a chef as you've immersed yourself in a different style of, of cookery and cuisine? I suppose it's, um, you know, the, the food we do is uh, a lot simpler than I've always um, always needed to or felt the need to be involved with. So it initially took some time to dumb my thinking down to actually say, well, if I can make a, a beautiful salt crud coquette, it doesn't need much else. Um, so in that in that sense, and, and particularly in, in training my head chefs and the chefs down the tree, um, you know, it's, it's about minimizing things and, and appreciating that we can do beautiful food with the tools that we have and, um, you know, part of the development of the junior staff is giving a lot of them opportunity to to put forward dishes, and and quite often the feedback will be, um, you know, do you think it needs this and this? Could it just be, you know, those those two elements? So, um, you know, the way of thinking in terms of how we build a menu and build a dish has certainly changed for me over the years. What's what sort of impact has it had on? your uh, love of food has it has it changed the way uh, you see the role of a, of a head chef uh the older i get i suppose um you know I've, I've of course i've got a love of food and a love of creativity but i also have a love of being able to engage my teams to and give them the opportunity to to be involved with that process so the the lo- the the longer i've been in you know this job um the less i've actually had to um create dishes which is i suppose you know where i wanted the direction of my career to be i you know I'm, i've i recognized early on that i didn't want to be a a, a chef at 60 slogging it slogging it over the stove and then there needed to be a way to to get out of the kitchen so um you know recognizing the talent within the team has certainly um changed the way that i you know, think about my role as a executive chef and, um, you know, if you can recruit people that already have a passion and, and will continue to have the passion and creativity and, and you know, act, act, actively engaging their junior staff, that's where, you know, that's where my love sits for, for food right now is, you know, developing um, people for the future, I suppose. What, what do you love about Argentinian in cuisine? I think Argentinian cuisine, um, the love is, um, you know, the, is part of the the the, the package. Or part of the part of the love is the package of the the 
the process of the cook, um, the process of a cook in Argentina is to, you know, do your preparation in the, in the morning. Um, you put some small bits of, you know, a couple of bits of sausage on the grill at lunchtime and, um, you know, you throw your big cuts of meat on at the same time and it's a progression of dining from, you know, let's say one o'clock right through to seven o'clock at night. So um, I like the concept of how that um, relates to what I enjoy about entertaining and um, cooking at home. It's, you know, like we all do, it's great to have mates over and light the barbie and crack some beers and uh, spend a day with people that you may not you know, may not, may not get to see very often. So in the restaurants, I suppose, particularly our way of dining is about a progression of menu. So starting off with small islands being at empanadas or croquettes and moving into smaller meats and some some lighter entrees and then hitting the big stuff off the, off the grill. And, um, you know, I, I think the concept is part of um, what makes Argentinian food so good. The last year and a half has had a major impact on so many, but has there been some positives to come out of uh, this adversity for you? Um, I suppose it's, you know, the positives would would um, would analyse uh, human nature and, and, and team spirit in, in the way that we've been able to consider retaining all of our staff through the pandemic. Um, when I say all, um, you know, people have left, people have gone back overseas and, and moved on. Um, but uh, particularly during the first lockdown, it was our intentions to retain everyone um, when we were able to get back up and running. So particularly, you know, long lockdown. In the beginning, we had um, 45, you know, international staff that, didn't have access to job keepers. So, you know, we ran Asada as a, as a takeaway venue because we've got a, a little takeaway shop out the back. Um, and any any profit that we made or any of the sales we made went to them so that they could pay their rent and, um, pay their rent and uh, you know, live week to week. Uh, so, you know, obviously, if, you know, that's great support, but also we wanted to re-engage them um, and – Show them, show them respect when, when we were able to operate again. So along the way, um, you know, our staff have recognised that there's care from ownership and, and senior management that their, their needs and um, desires are at the forefront before, uh, before anything else. Um, you know, certainly we want to we get up to speed and get, it, get our restaurants back up and running, but if we don't have the staff there to run them for us there's there's not much left so you know that that um that mentality is filtered through the team and you know junior staff um you know you know mid-level staff certainly um are more engaged with um you know a team environment and a caring environment and making sure that everyone's well looked after whether it's at work or you know, during during the next lockdown, you know, people, a commie chef will say, "Oh, is is Joe Blow and Maria getting um, hours next week?" Because you know that's really important, and we'll we'll sort of, you know, put their mind at ease to say, "Yes, that's uh, that's certainly something that we want to we want to be doing to make sure that everyone's okay." What sort of advice would you have for young people looking for clear career paths and to make a real success in the industry? I think a a, a key a key part of, you know, once you've chosen um, to be in hospitality and you commit to, you know, delving into a kitchen, um, you, you you really need to, you know, once you're there, be in fully engaged and be someone that is um, always seeking training and seeking to learn. I find a lot of kids, you know, will come in and, You've, you know, here's your section, you're on larder, you know, here's your induction, here's the training for larder. And then they, you know, they do, they go about their business and, um, you know, do well in that regard. But, uh, you know, the people that always excel are the ones that are trying to learn um, tasks that aren't specific to what they've already been trained. So I, I would always hope that, you know, someone is asking one day, can I bone some chickens with you? Um as opposed to waiting for six months for someone to say, would you like to bone some chickens? Um, the more you, more you can learn at an earlier age and, 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 
you know, obviously you've got to, you know, once you've got the skills, you've got to practice them and, and you know, um, implement them in in your roles. But if you've got, um, you know, if you've got you've got someone that's willing to teach you, seek um, seek the learning as well as, um, you know, uh, wait before waiting for it. Well, that's amazing advice, um, Oliver. I'd, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds to hear your story. Uh, please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, mate. Really good talking to you. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.